say a few opening remarks and then just open it up for questions because I'd really I'm going to learn from you all uh, much more than you'll learn from me. And that what I uh, was um, we were talking here earlier. I've been head of the Alliance for Excellent Education five years and qualified me to write a book after three. Uh, and much, much of the book is focused on what I've learned in the last five years that I wish I'd known the previous 24 uh, when I was in public life because I think I would have been a lot better for education. I like to think we got some things done, but I, I would have been a lot better. And one of the th areas that I regret that I missed the most, but I think I'm not I don't think I'm alone on that, is um, I focused, as you recall, obviously on access to college and the Promise Scholarship and, finance and uh, the HEAT Fund and, and um, financial access generally. I also focused, if you recall, uh, we signed the legislation that created the four -year program for all four-year-olds uh, over 12 years to be able to have uh, uh, quality education. So early childhood, post-secondary. But I missed something. I miss the middle. I miss the uh, middle and uh, I miss the secondary schools. And indeed, when I got to back to Washington, I realized that a whole bunch of other folks had too. I said, I don't feel alone. Because if you look at, you look at what's happening in this country, and it's only been recently, and I credit No Child Left Behind with this aspect of it. Some things I credit No Child Left Behind with that aren't so positive. But, but with this, very positively, it forced us to look at every grade, every student. And what we began to see is that all of a sudden, in the uh, most uh, well, in the wealthiest uh, industrial democracy in the, in the world, we still today have the same graduation rate essentially that we had 30 or 40 years ago. The way it works out in the United States of America is a third of our uh, right now uh, of all the kids sitting in ninth grade, a third aren't going to graduate; they're going to drop out, and a third are going to finish, but they're not going to finish with the skills they need for college or career. President Tomlin and I were just talking about remediation <laughs> rates, and uh, you were saying about 60% in your school. That's what I run across uh, all over the nation. We did an analysis at my organization. We estimated very conservatively, used the most conservative data, and found out in, in community colleges in this country, there's a, it's about a 40, that's was three years ago, it was about 42%. I think the Department of Education has just announced it's gone up to about 50 now, but what, what does remediation indicate? It indicates that we're, something's not happening in the middle, in the secondary schools. Uh, that we're, that it, we, we can also track ACT data as well as NAEP trend lines uh, for the last 30 years, and it shows exactly the same thing, that we have made progress in this country uh, in uh, uh, raising scores in reading and math, particularly on NAEP, uh, but also through most state proficiency exams, we have made progress in the early grades. Fourth grade, NAEP over the last 30 years has, has gone up fairly significantly. It begins leveling off at the eighth grade. And the progress is back where, by 12th grade, is back where it was 30 years ago. And indeed, if you look at NAEP scores in the state of West Virginia, which just came out, you see that we essentially have flatlined, unfortunately, uh, in the eighth grade for reading uh, and, and I think we're doing, yeah, we're doing a little better in math. So I, when I make my remarks here and I make my remarks tonight, I want to stress this is a national situation. It is not a uniquely West Virginia one. But having said that, we all have to live where we live and do what we can where we live. And so what I'm here to talk about is what, do, what can we do to help boost the middle? That doesn't ignore what needs to be done. I happen to believe strongly, and you build, have to build a strong foundation. I spent much of my uh, government life working on early childhood issues. I happen to believe, obviously, about the importance of post-secondary, but we do desperately have to focus on the middle and that preparation. Let me give you some statistics. We, I know some of this is about community engagement, and so one of the things that um, I'm, I'm never running for office again, but I do. I am involved in a massive campaign. This is the last campaign I'll ever run, uh, and that is to improve high schools. Now, the good news is there's never an election day. Uh, and the other good news is that so far, nobody's run a negative ad against me. Uh, but I go across the country. I, I stump for what we have to do to improve high schools. At the end of the day, my organization will be working at the federal level, but we hope that the information we provide supports people's efforts at the local and state level as well. We're about advocacy. 
And so we also know this. We know that 70% of the American public has no contact with the public school system. They do not have a child in the public school system. Now, that will vary state to state and county to county. But for the most part, we're, we're an aging population. So like Sandy and I, our kids are out of the public school system. Uh, we're, we're young, whatever it is. But so, as you well know, it can be tough enough to get parents involved. Now try to get a bunch of people who don't have a direct state. And so I spend a good deal of my time trying to show people why it is that that high school 10 miles or 15 miles away that they don't have any relation to and never sent their child to if they did have children has a direct impact on their life. And so what we do is we try to combine the, what I call the equity imperative and the economic imperative. The equity imperative is this, and that's what bring, and I think it's what motivates every one of us to be here, and that is that every child deserves a quality education. Flat to me, done. Every child deserves a quality education. I call that, I quote the Bible or the Quran, uh, that education is finer than spun gold or silver, more precious than rubies. Now I go, though, to the economic imperative, uh, and that is that we in document that every child who graduates from high school will see a significant, and the community will see a significant economic gain. And so whether I get you at the Bible or the billfold, what I'm trying to do is to get you involved. And so uh, one of the things we do, and, and we'll talk about tonight, uh, Pat, is, is we're going to be, so we did an analysis at the Alliance for Excellent Education. We do economic analysis of what's happening in every state. What does it mean to improve the high school graduation rate, the college going rate, the college attainment rate? And so, uh, for, for instance, in West Virginia, and we've been doing this at, at a state level, we've been doing this analysis for five years, and it shows that this, the class of 2009 that did not graduate, that dropped out somewhere in that four-year period, that class over their working lives will cost the state about $2 billion in lost wages cost the state about $55 million in, in uncompensated health care because dropouts have worse health care incidents than non-dropouts. It will, um, I've got to check my state card, Joy, uh, uh, because I, I want to look at the remediation costs. Uh, actually, I'm going to cheat and check my state card right now. Um, because, it, because and then if we do get them through high school and they don't have, um, they don't have what they need, to go on to college or career, then and we're paying remedial costs, then we have that as well. So now what we've done though is we've been talking about the state level for years. Now we're talking, we've gotten it, we've broken it down to the metropolitan area. And so tonight I'll be releasing for the first time some statistics on the metropolitan area. But to give you an example, in the Charleston metropolitan area, or and actually the large number of you from Mon County, uh, I'll give you Morgantown as well. In the Charleston metropolitan area, which is Kanawha County plus four surrounding counties, Clay, Clay Boone, uh, and two others, I have to check which ones. But uh, if you could simply cut the dropout rate in half for one class, and I want to stress that this is one class, this is not cumulative dropouts in this area, but for one class, uh, by the time they're fully involved and integrated into the workforce, and that's going to be 20 years, but by the time they're 39, they will generate, and that one class will generate $5.1 million of additional income over what they otherwise would have. Significantly, uh, because I believe you've got to talk to people about, you want to talk to the business community, so what is it the realtors are interested in? Uh, home sales. And so that this class, one group, will be able to generate an additional eight over $8 million in mortgage capability. They will be able to generate an additional half a million dollars in car sales. This is going to be a group of kids that would have, if you, they wanted a car, would have walked into the new showroom and been immediately taken out to the back lot to look at the 13-year-old Ford Fusion, cash only thing. Now they can stay up front um, uh, in financing. It would result in that one class will pay an additional $600,000 in taxes. Uh, let me just quickly give you Morgantown. Morgantown, because or Mon County, and I think it's because you, it probably has a lower dropout rate than some of the rest of the state. But Mon, so the numbers aren't, and also a smaller population with, outside Mon County. Um, uh, but Mon County, it, it, those numbers are it's about 2.2 .2 million in increased earnings, 3.6 in increased home capacity, uh, and another $200,000 in 